I want to introduce you to um, Rupal Shaw. Rupal and I go back a long way. Um, Rupal leads uh, uh, High Point uh, Technology, which is, you know, they really started with uh, a mobile device and a technology. And you could tell they started to morph themselves into serving students, serving campuses. Um, so I'm not trying to pitch Rupal's company, but Rupal's one of those thought leaders that even when I was beginning beyond, I went to Rupal and I said, hey, Rupal, this is what I'm thinking about doing. And he gave me some great advice, told me, say, hey, Matt, this is what I think the market needs. So for day one, you know, when we asked Rupal to join us on this discussion about the topics, the topic of student agency came into play. And I'm gonna let Rupal talk a little bit about it, but Rupal, thanks for being here. It's yours. You may wanna start sharing your quiller and uh, take it from there. Will do. Thanks, Matt. I really appreciate the, uh, the opportunity. And, you know, those are nice words. And um, I'm assuming you can hear me okay. Just a quick sound check, thumbs up. Okay, cool. So uh, yeah, it was a unique opportunity. And, and, you know, when you kind of presented it, what I wanted to do was really just kind of share some thoughts in my seat over the last kind of eight years of what I've seen in the market and, you know, where I kind of see things going in the future. And I wasn't really, you know, thinking about, okay, we need to shill some software or services, et cetera. I just wanted to kind of start a dialogue around what I was experiencing and, you know, kind of my thoughts and, and kind of what the future is going to hold. So hopefully this conversation will be instructive and useful to, to many people. And, you know, certainly, you know, as we go through this, if you've got <clears throat> comments or chats or, or ideas, uh, feel free to, um, you know, put those in. So I'm going to start off with uh, a very short story. It's not going to be, uh, I'm sure it's not dissimilar to what many of you have experienced on the, on the phone today. And it's really about my first uh, Uber ride. And it was almost a decade ago. I still remember it vividly. Um, I was in Austin. We were having our first uh, higher ed summit at the company I was working at. And a, a couple of the folks, clients and colleagues wanted to go see some live music. And uh, I said, well, you know, I live in town. I know where to go. And I said, I'll hail a cab. And just then a colleague stopped me and he said, no, 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 uh, let me get you an Uber. And I said, well, what is that? And uh, he started to explain, you know, what Uber was and he was looking at his phone and he was inputting some information and uh, kind of talking through it. A couple of minutes after he was done explaining that, uh, a black car showed up right next to us. And, and I was just, stunned, uh, a little apprehensive. And he said, don't worry, uh, just get inside, uh, get to your destination and just walk out when you're done, close the door. And I, it just, you know, the concept just was so foreign to me at that time. And that's what we did. We got in the car. Um, I have to say it's quite odd, but, you know, I felt like this was a really cool experience. We get to our destination, we walk out, um, there was no real awkward conversation with uh, the driver. There's no cash that needed to be exchanged, no credit card. I didn't need to do um, some math off you know, top of my head to figure out the tip, et cetera. And it really felt effortless. It was a completely different experience that I've had. And I know every one of you probably had that experience. And it was literally uh, kind of the proverbial walking out of Plato's cave where once you've experienced something like that, you can't unsee it or undo it. You've, you've been changed and you see, you know, a different world. And uh, there are lots of things, uh, and I'm sure everyone can attest to this, that things kind of came about uh, during that age of Uber. So we started to see Netflix. We started to see Amazon was there, Amazon Prime, maybe uh, Airbnb. The emergency iPhone was, was pretty dramatic. Uh, for me, I was a big fan of the BlackBerry for a long time, and just making that switch was monumental. At that time, you know, uh, almost a decade ago, I was working with arguably one of the most advanced uh, machine learning companies doing work in higher ed. And, and I knew a lot about, from that experience, uh, about nonlinear algorithms, uh, AI and machine learning, and things like support vector machines, neural nets, and I knew the power that that could have. What I discovered um, was th there was also a lot of power in design. And admittedly, I think, you know, the, the title of this presentation, you know, when we kind of decided 
what it was going to be as student agency and, and technology, you know, I, I would add that uh, a big part of this is design. And that's what I'm going to talk about today. It's really about design and kind of how does that map with, you know, uh, an institution? What are they attempting to accomplish and how are they going to uh, get there? And as many of you know, 2008 was kind of a monumental year. Um, it was kind of the catalyst for many things, it was kind of the earthquake and the tsunami started to follow thereafter. And we started to see a lot of uh, defunding in higher education, but we saw a lot of changes in the software space and consumer space and millennials were, were kind of dealt, uh, you know, bad deck of cards, quite honestly. And, and we started to see the power shift from, you know, larger companies to uh, the consumer iPhone was kind of empowering too. And so with all that said, it started to kind of change my thinking and worldview. And I know it changed for, for many of the folks um, that are on the phone, but it was this idea around agency. It was this ability to be able to do things, you know, in a more seamless way. And I know a lot of you get that in your bones. And, you know, I think for, for many of us in higher ed, uh, whether we're working in higher ed or, you know, working in the periphery, we're doing a lot of work to kind of explain what this really means. And, and I think a lot of people think, okay, let's just check the box when it comes to design thinking, but it goes a lot deeper than that. So kind of fast forward a little bit and, you know, I don't want to be dramatic about uh, higher ed disruption. I, I don't think that we're going to see the level of disruption necessarily that we're seeing with the companies and industries that I have in front of you, but certainly I think there's some uh, areas where we can optimize. And, uh, you know, arguably if you look at taxis and movies and autos and all the companies that moving from the left to the right, we went from, you know, a pretty large incumbency to new entrants relatively in the last 10 years with the exception of Amazon. And that's pretty dramatic. And if it's, you know, on the order of billions, maybe even trillions of dollars that kind of, you know, moved from one area to another. And so, you know, what did these companies do that was so impactful? And I, I want to argue that they did two things. One was information uh, asymmetry. So for a very long time, for hundreds of years, maybe even arguably a thousand years, the seller had more information than the buyer. And it wasn't until, let's say, the last 10 years that uh, the, the, level, the playing field had leveled. Now, take the Uber example. I know exactly where the car is. I know when it's going to arrive. I know how much it's going to cost. I know the rating for the driver. And I know what time I'm going to get to the location that I'm looking for, which is dramatically different than what we experienced with a regular taxi, you know, years prior. We didn't know any of that information, really. And so uh, that, that's a big, big thing. And it really changes the dynamics. The second thing, and I would say more importantly, is the user experience. So now it's not about the business uh, you know, dictating the terms. And again, if you use the informational asymmetry concept, it's really the buyer is really dictating the terms. And so we've built this user experience around the buyer. And, and that's really instructive. And that's why I think a lot of these uh, companies took off. So how does that really relate to higher ed in our world? Well, there's still a lot of things to kind of sort out, but I'd argue just kind of as one example, one point. If you go on to Google right now and you do a search for student centers, higher education, and you look at the images, you're gonna see some amazing buildings for student centers uh, that have either been built or under construction. And you know these institutions are doing what they know and think are really going to be impactful. It's good work. Um, and they're putting together financial aid advisors, academic advisors, et cetera, in these buildings to help students open from nine to five. But I can't help wonder and think that, okay, is this like the big box retailers? This is brick and mortar. Are we working on the student's schedule? Are we giving them agency? Should we move from a student center to a, a brick and mortar student center to a digital student center? And that's really kind of the point of this whole discussion is should we be rethinking how we approach things? And you know, years ago we thought, okay, find all the at-risk students, let's start calling them. Well, the truth is, is that you know, uh, up to 80% of the millennials and Gen Z really don't like, uh, or they prefer messaging and texting and they don't like phone calls where about 77% of baby boomers are fine. They have no anxiety around phone calls. And they're operating from nine to five. And, and this notion of millennials and Gen Zs, we are not born that way. We're, we're kind of reacting into the environment of the time that we we're born in. And for someone like me, I'm, I'm in my mid forties. 
I don't really want to have to get in a car, drive down and meet with a financial aid advisor either. I've got work and family commitments. So I want to be able to have agency and do these things on my own. And that's really kind of, you know, the shift from a legacy way of thinking to kind of more of a, a you know, user centric uh, perspective. So, so what's next? Well, I think it's instructive to kind of look at the past and kind of looking forward to the future and kind of what, what's really ahead of us. And uh, if you look back the 80s and 90s, uh, tremendous growth in terms of ERP development, and we were basically um, optimizing the linear pathways and, and codifying business processes through technology. You know, HR, payroll, financials were cut across lots of industries, and you had to go customize at each at uh, for healthcare, higher ed, et cetera. And the catalyst was really mainframes and uh, relational databases. And then we kind of moved in the 2000s to this verticalization where we're building companies and bringing together designers, engineers, marketers, data scientists to solve very specific problems, whether it's in healthcare, higher ed, finance, et cetera. And this is the age where, uh, as Matt, you discussed earlier, AI, machine learning, uh, cloud computing really kind of created this ability. And if you look at that first wave, that was really there to kind of help the back office users. I'd argue in the second wave, it's really to empower these mid-level uh, uh, users to kind of use analytics to make better decisions. And I think we've kind of now entered this uh, third wave and we still don't know uh, what's gonna happen with this phase. I mean, I think the, I know I'm mixing enterprise with consumer in this last phase and that's by design because we're still kind of absorbing what we're seeing in you know, uh, our daily lives. What are the analogs of Uber to kind of the uh, enterprise world? But it's really about a focus on users. And I think the argument that I wanna make is that you know, on top of AI and, and all that data and the ERP systems design really matters. And uh, I'll go on a little bit of a tangent here, but I think it's an instructive story. There's a professor, JC Licklider, back in 1960 at MIT coin, it wrote this amazing paper called the man-machine symbiosis theory. And it's really this idea of like, over time, uh, humans are good at creative thinking, intuitive strategy, and uh, computers are good at computational uh, uh, things. And so we saw the mainframe to the PC, to the mobile phone and smartphones, and that you know dramatically improved our lives. And a good example of this was you know, years ago, uh, Deep Blue, if you remember from IBM, beat Gary Kasparov in a chess competition. Well, and I think a lot of people thought, okay, that's the big insight. Well, it really wasn't. It was years later, we discovered that amateurs with a small, you know, mobile phone sized uh, chess device or, or game could beat uh, Gary Kasparov, could also beat the Deep Blue, but then in some cases could actually beat a chess master with uh, 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 a supercomputer. So that was really you know, life-changing in terms of the capabilities of you know, AI, machine learning, and, and humans using that information. And, and I've really been at the front seat of some of that stuff and I've seen you know, the impact of that. And I've also seen institutions kind of think, all right, well, we still haven't gotten the results that we're looking for. And I'd argue that it's really about design. And so if you take the chronology of what I kind of described and you really stacked it on top of each other and you create this abstraction where, you know, the base of it is really the digital data processing. You add the AI machine learning aspect of it. Those things are great. And you're giving, you know, some great information to users. What I'd argue is that there's still a big body of work that we need to interrogate to really improve student agency. And that's really around behavioral science. So the gentleman on the left is uh, Richard Thaler, won the Nobel Prize for Economics just a few years ago. And he did a lot of great work on framing and he wrote the book Nudge, uh, Anchoring. There's just a ton of work around choice architecture. And the gentleman on the right is Dan Ariely of Duke who wrote the book Predictably Irrational. And he does a lot of great work in behavioral science. This is a little bit of a side story at High Point, Duke University is one of our uh, top customers, and they actually took our software and put it into Dan Ariely's lab, and they wanted to run an experiment to see, you know, could the user experience the behavioral science around accepting financial aid change behaviors of students? Could we create a, uh, an experiment where students are accepting less debt? And it turned out that there was great signal in providing different user interfaces on that. And so we actually changed our software based on those results. So 
those kinds of things where you're actually helping students in the long run to make better behaviors and decisions is critical. The other side of it is the interaction design. And this is kind of what I think a lot of folks can see through Amazon or Uber, et cetera, being able to you know, use your software, use the company's tools on your phone in a seamless, easy way. And there's a whole body of work there too. If you think about cognitive load or digital affordances or mental models, there are a lot of deep design thinking concepts that are applied to these tools. And that's where I'm arguing, let's, let's interrogate that. Let's focus on that because that will drive a lot of outcomes, particularly in this day and age where whether we're in pandemic or we're shifting, you know, kind of the modality and the models that we're offering in higher ed, could we be designing this in a way that's a lot more effective? And, and you know, I think everybody knows that the traditional student enrollment numbers are going to drop in the coming years. The majority of students are non-traditional, so they don't have the time and effort and luxury of time. And so they need to get in and out and accomplish things pretty quickly. So what's the call to action? So um, I think, you know, folks have seen lots of versions of this uh, image where you have a design and you have behaviors. And uh, to Matt's comment early, where we're spending a lot as an industry to repave the same path, what I argue is let's have some empathy and let's try to understand where students are trying to go. Let's get to their point. And in a way, this kind of illustrates the chart and the image that I showed earlier around the brick and mortar versus where, what students want. If you can imagine this kind of circles, what we, we build in our mind, but the reality is the students wanna go from point A to point B and they're showing you that. And one way to do that is to have a lot of empathy. And I took this course through IDEA, which is this amazing company based out of, you know, started out of Stanford. And it was just, you know, uh, a short course, but it changed my thinking. And, and, you know, a lot of things that you guys can take away from this, uh, that class that I took or some comments I'm making here is that, you know, if you, if you want to really understand, you got to walk in uh, the shoes of students. And so as an example, in the kind of the physical world, you know, if you want to understand what it's like to be disabled, maybe just tie your arm behind your back and experience your campus for half a day to a day or get into a wheelchair and kind of see through their eyes, like, what is it like? You could also do that in the digital world. You can get a group together and go through the process of applying, do a FAFSA form, figure out, okay, when does that come back to you if you have a reject ICER? How do you deal with these issues? How do you pay for uh, tuition or enroll in a class? And how can you deconstruct that process and really design in a way where you're getting to their point and giving students the agency to do the things that they want to do in a faster, seamless way? So I think those are some of the things that, you know, uh, you know, from a call to action that I think is important. And you can kind of use these powers for good. I mean, if you think about the behavioral science work that Richard Thaler does, it's just some interesting work out there. Uh, if you think uh, about decoys and, and a lot of companies do this where, I don't know if you've noticed this or not, but let's say like the economist will put out three different options for print package, a digital package and a print and digital package. Well, one of those options is a decoy. It's to get you to buy one or two of the other options. So in that way, they're kind of trying to nudge their buyers to maximize profit. You can take those powers and use them for good in higher ed to kind of create the right choice architecture so they're making the right decisions. And this can be employed in lots of different ways. You don't have to buy technology to do it. Uh, if you do, it would be useful to kind of understand these concepts. And, and in many ways, uh, books like this which is real thin, you could read it in 20, 30 minutes. I did it a couple of years ago and it changed my life around design. You start to see the world in a different way. So uh, closing thoughts, um, I'll keep it short at this point, but you know, the idea is really get a team together, start thinking about how things can improve on campus. Can technology solve it? Maybe, maybe not, it's not always a silver bullet. Uh, can you change the experience and the environment that students are having to deal with? Think about your students today, what, it, what would make their lives easier and think about the students you wanna have in the future and kind of redesign that process. Start with those outcomes and those ideas first and then reason backwards to figure out, do you have the tools? Can you make better use of them or do you need to purchase new tools to do that? And do that in a way that creates an effortless, seamless uh, uh, experience, very similar to Uber. So that's, uh, that's the end of my presentation and, and happy to answer any questions or thoughts. Yeah, no, Rupal, one, first of all, way to kick it off, right? So 
your visuals were spot on. And, and this is one of the things I keep saying to people is that you don't need PowerPoint with words and a lot, like the power of words that you're speaking to is so important. So one, kudos to that. Two, I love the word that you used. And I think this is probably something uh, higher ed should really think about, especially when they're thinking about putting in new technologies and, and things like that. One of the biggest reasons that, that schools never get the ROI on any of the technology they do is they never stop and deconstruct. You, you use the word deconstruct, and that's a tough word for many people because they're so used to the circle that you showed out there. They're so used to following the circle. But the reality of it is, it is time for us, it's a license to change, to become the ability to say, let's deconstruct why we do what we do. Because if you think about most systems and most, you know, like I said, I, I went to my offices here where I ran a registrar's office, they still do 1990 stuff. They just digitized what I used to do. And I'm thinking to myself, my God, I could automate that in like in weeks. And yet they don't think that way because they, they just digitized. And, and this is that repaving the road that I keep talking about. The thing that I, I would love for you to talk about is the design of a campus, right? You talk about experience. I talk about frictionless outcomes, method. The thing that we have to realize is that what we do today is gonna to be different in a year from now and two years from now. This is the future of work element that I always, I'm really enamored by. How does a campus continue to evolve that design? You're doing it inside of your software all the time, right? You're doing that to build out a product line. But how does a campus think about designing every year what their experience looks like? Yeah, I, I think that um, it, it's a tough problem. I think, you know, higher ed and healthcare are very similar. There's only a few industries where, you know, and I'm thinking from a technology perspective, and I'll kind of get back to kind of your point here, but um, that the purchaser is not the user. And there's a cognitive dissonance, if that's the word you want to use, between those uh, stakeholders, those actors, and it creates a, a gap in understanding and usability. And so my argument is bring those students in. I can't tell you how many years uh, I've done presentations and orals and discussions where we haven't really seen students part of that conversation. And I've heard people say, well, you know, I like a mobile app to have this very similar to Starbucks or want it to do this or that. Well, you have an income. You have a different set of perspectives. Students have different perspectives. There was a call where I listened to the evaluation committee at one uh, community college and they said, this was profound to me. She said, we were evaluating mobile solutions. And she said, 70% uh, of our students are on financial aid and all of the solutions with the exception of one, you can't look at financial aid. So 70% of the students won't be using that mobile application. So I think it's kind of thinking about, all right, what are we trying to solve? What are the areas? How do you start you know, thinking about areas you want to interrogate and have impact on, cast forward, reason backwards, and really deeply think about, okay, what is a student? How is that student going to use it? Are they going to use it? Is it going to have impact? Because we all have biases. We all have uh, different ideas, but we want to bring that to the table, but we're not solving the problem for me and Starbucks and a button and all those things. It's really for students. And if you give, you know, a darn about that, then you'll really start changing. 